Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the ELECT webinar on cataloging non-English materials. I'm Erin Elzey, a member of the ELECT Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Joy DeBose and Preston Salisbury. Joy is an assistant professor and the cataloger for special collections at Mississippi State University. She has presented at the annual conference of the AL American Library Association on Cataloging Non-English Materials and Digitization. She's also presented at ALA Midwinter on Library Consortia. Currently, she's the co-chair for the Elect CAMS Copy Cataloging Interest Group. She holds a Master of Library and Information Science from the University of Southern Mississippi. Preston is an assistant professor and monographic cataloger, also at Mississippi State University. He received his MLIS from the University of Southern Mississippi. Prior to working at Mississippi State, he has cataloging experience at community college and public libraries in Mississippi and Texas. He has cataloged materials in over a dozen languages. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is A-L-C-T-S-C-E. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for Joy and Preston, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now we'll turn it over to Joy and Preston. Note that there will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ELEX webinar, Cataloging Non-English Materials. My name is Joy Dubos, and I'm an assistant professor and the special collections cataloger at Mississippi State University. And my name is Preston Salisbury. I am the assistant professor monographic cataloger at Mississippi State University. Now, before we get started, we are going to tell you a little bit about Mississippi State University and some of the non-English collections we have dealt with. MSU is a four-year land-grant research institution. The library itself has two museums, one being the Presidential Library of Ulysses S. Grant. Now, all the examples that you see today will come from three collections, the John Grisham Collection, the Todd Herring Collection, and the William Starling Collection. The John Grisham Collection contains the papers and works of the literary novelist John Grisham, who is an alum of MSU. The works in this collection are in roughly 30 different languages, some of them very obscure. For the Herring Collection, Dr. Herring traveled around Europe and collected anything that he thought was shiny, as our archivist puts it. In his collection, there is a myriad of items from Russian children's books, Ukrainian graphic novels, Nazi propaganda, posters from the Cold War, 18th century French magazines, and many other pieces. Finally, the Starling Collection was created by Major William Starling, who died in 1901. During his time, he was a collector of books and could read classical Latin and Greek as he had been given a gentleman's education. The books in this collection range from the 16th century to the 19th century. These books were originally given to a public library before coming to MSU. This collection is also in the process of being recatalogued, as many mistakes have been found in the original records. These collections are just some of the non-English materials that we have tangled with. Today, we are going to share some of the lessons and tools that we discovered while working with them. We hope to cover several things with you today, among them understanding the rules governing the cataloging of non-English materials, using online tools for translation, the need to research and some examples of how to, and where to look when stuck on a piece. So now to get to the meat of the matter, we're going to start off with the cataloging rules and framework needed for these materials. 
After all, it's impossible to play the game without knowing the rules. First, uh, we will begin with a recap of some cataloging basics. I'm confident that we are all familiar with the basics of a bibliographic record, and I hope that it is somewhat comforting to know that non-English materials are going to require the same information in the bibliographic record as will English materials. Of course, those basic components would be the title, author, publisher, relevant dates, the extent or the dimensions of the items, subject headings, and for some materials, series statements. When cataloging non-English materials, assuming, of course, that English is your main language of cataloging, the only addition to the record would be the language and possibly a script note, the only addition to those basic things that I've already mentioned. Uh, that will, of course, go in your 546 field. Now, I hope to simplify this discussion of rules somewhat by organizing most of it by the Mark 21 field. First, however, I'm going to go on a little bit of a hunt so you can see some of the materials that we've worked with and some things that you might encounter as well. We need the, this information. We need the title, author, publisher, and, and so on. And sometimes the most difficult thing can be finding the required information. And somewhat unfortunately, I will note this is no longer true simply for non-English materials. We are in a golden age of self-publication, and I've encountered plenty of English books as well that are published without a true title page or with a title page that does not have all of the required information. Sometimes this will seem like a game of hide and seek. One thing that I've discovered that is helpful when dealing with non-English materials is to know your country of publication. Different countries or different publishers have different standards for where they like to hide their information. Of course, we have to remember that self-publication will happen in other countries as well, and some publishing companies, and I've noticed this seems to be particularly true in the developing world, might forgo a title page entirely. Here are a few examples of where information might be found. Major Slovenian publishers tend to be very helpful, at least for the American cataloger. They include SIP data on the title page verso. As we can see here in this copy of Platonov Drevered, my apologies if that pronunciation is not completely correct, which is a translation of John Grisham's Sycamore Row. This very helpfully includes a Dewey number for libraries that will be using Dewey, author, title information that basically is exactly what you would need for your 245 field, an edition statement, and a publication statement. Czechia, which was formerly until very recently the Czech Republic, is not very far from Slovenia geographically, but they place the majority of their publication information on the completely opposite end of the book. Czech publishers tend to opt for a minimal title page, often with just the title and the author, sometimes with the translator as well on the title page verso. However, they put a wealth of information on the colophon or the back matter. Here we see from top to bottom the author and title, the original English title and publication information for the English original, the translator, various editors and designers, the publisher, complete with an address, the date for the Czech edition, the edition statement, and some information as well on the distributor, including uh, address and phone number. So I guess if you want to order extra copies, you can do that. While the title page in the front matter of this book is almost non-existent, the back matter provides a veritable cornucopia of information. Some Indian and East Asian publishers might provide a mixture of English and of the language of publication. This can help you to know what book you have. However, if you're cataloging for BIBCO or uh, Partnership for Cooperative Cataloging Standards, 
it does not help very much because we're supposed to use the main language and script when cataloging for Bibco anyway. This is a book that conveniently has the title, author, and translator there in English. And as anyone who has encountered very many books from the subcontinent knows, it is also very convenient that it has the language that it's published in because those languages tend to confuse uh, native English speakers. At first glance, it might seem that the information provided there in English is sufficient to create at least a level K record for the item. However, I will note that the copyright date shown is the copyright for the English original and has absolutely nothing to do with the Marathi translation. If you need to find a publication date, that will be written in the Devanagari script at, that you see below. That's not going to be in our Roman characters or in standard English numerals. But as I've already mentioned, to catalog to RDA or Bibco standards, we would have to use the language of the item. And so we would need to translate or transliterate the Marathi to catalog this item anyway. Now, before I go much further, I want to emphasize something that I believe is very important when approaching cataloging of non-English materials. And that is that we need to keep serving the patron in mind. There are a lot of rules, but our job is to serve our constituents. And my belief is that you should do the best that you can. Transliteration can be a difficult process and a time-consuming process. I'll get more into that later. Providing the fullest possible cataloging record for non-English materials will sometimes need to take a backseat to providing the best possible service to patrons, especially to patrons who are hungering for materials in their own languages. As you may have noticed in my introduction, I have worked at a public library where we had a lot of, of non-English speakers who were looking for materials in their languages. That would be a situation where you would probably need to expedite rather than trying to get a perfect record. I'll also take this opportunity to say a brief word about subject headings, because I'm not going to say a lot about that. Now, it is not possible, of course, to provide adequate subject cataloging for resources in a language that one cannot read. However, if the book in question is a translation of a book in English, as were the three items that I just showed, it is entirely possible and permissible to use the subject headings of the work. As a rule, of course, subject headings should be in the language of the cataloging agency, which would be English for most American catalogers. However, it is permissible, and I believe it is preferable when you are serving a large population of non-English speakers to provide supplemental subject headings in the language of that population. There are several options out there for Spanish subject headings, for one example. But most of what I say is not as concerned about subject cataloging. I do think it would be wonderful if we could provide subject cataloging for every item, but this is simply not feasible. And if we attempted to do so, this would unfairly disadvantage languages that are not spoken by very many catalogers. Now, it may be possible to require subject cataloging for French German, or even Chinese, but I have yet to meet a librarian who is fluent in Xhosa or Herrero. Obviously, if we're cataloging at the full level, and certainly for Bibco, subject headings are a necessary part of that. But if it is impossible for you to do that, and you need to get a book out there to serve your patrons, then level K records are much better than no records at all. Now we'll get on to the mark fields and where we're going to put the information. First off, your 1XX and 7XX fields are, with the exception basically of the 740 fields, fields for established headings. And we should assume that either headings are already established or we're going to use the form in which they will be established. If you're cataloging for PCC, uh, you need to remember that PCC uses the alternative to RDA 8.4, and that says that a transliterated form of the name should be used either instead of or in addition to the form on the item that you're cataloging. 
The proper transliteration tables for this purpose are those available on the Library of Congress website. I have a link there. These differ slightly from other transliteration standards, and I have noticed that this causes problems with English translations of books by authors with non-Roman script names. Many publishers use different transliteration standards, or they may actually not be using any transliteration standard at all, which leads to patrons and often, in my experience, other librarians complaining that the name on the bibliographic record is different from the name on the book. 100 or 700 fields should use the authorized form of the name, or if no authority record exists, the form which will most likely be the authorized form, and so they need to follow these tables. However, in your 245 subfield C, you will have the name transcribed exactly as it appears on the resource. So both forms of the name should be in the bib record. I'll note that East Asian languages and Turkish seem to be specifically problematic in this regard as far as transliteration problems. Also, another thing to note is that the first indicator should be correct because not every name follows the uh, surname first convention that we use for our standard English or American names. Icelandic names, for example, should always be in direct order, and Hungarian and different Asian names may also follow different conventions to your typical Western names. Now, I think the question will come up, why should we use these transliteration tables if they might lead to patron confusion? And uh, my answer to that is that we still need to use them because that is what, number one, that's what the rules say. That's the short answer. Uh, but the longer answer is that this transliteration should help librarians serve patrons by hopefully being able to pronounce things in the language of the patron. And that's important because, as we all know, many scripts do not display properly in our library catalogs. Transliteration should help to avoid tofu which is the term for those irritating little boxes that show up in records when a character is not recognized. And uh, I hope, my hope is that the ALA LC transliteration standards are designed to further avoid tofu as much as possible. So this would help to pronounce for the, uh, for the non-speaker of a language. Now we'll move on to titles, which as we know can go in multiple fields. The 240 field is used when there is an established title proper that differs from the title on the item. This can happen either because the work was originally published under a different title, or the item in hand is a translation of the work, or for some other reasons. Under PCC's use of RDA, initial articles should not be present in the 240 field. I will note that RDA, since 2014 does allow initial articles in title proper, but I do not believe that OCLC will allow you to put one there, uh, so try to avoid them anyway. If the item is a translation, then the language should be included in subfield L. The example I have here is from the book we saw earlier, John Grisham's A Time to Kill in Marathi. Note also that your 1XX, 7XX, and 240 fields are not transcribed from the resource in hand, not always transcribed from the resource in hand. They should be the authorized forms, which might be different from the form on the item. This, of course, can happen when cataloging uh, English resources as well. I recently had this happen when I was cataloging a DVD of an opera, and the performer had an authorized form of the name spelled differently from what was present on the title screen, and there was an authorized name in the name authority file that was spelled the exact same as was present on the title screen. So you have to be a little careful with this, both when you're doing English materials and non-English materials. But I do think this scenario happens more frequently when dealing with non-English materials. On the other hand, your 245 field should be transcribed as exactly as possible from the item in hand. I will note here that changes happening in RDA indicate a movement more and more towards replicating the text on the item as exactly as possible. There seems to be a movement towards replicating capitalization and even font type and size if possible. Now, thankfully, there is no requirement to do that yet, 
because it is simply not possible. RDA and LC uh, Partnership for Cooperative Cataloging do not require transcribing non-Roman scripts. This is preferred by RDA. If you are transcribing non-Roman scripts in this field or anywhere in the record, uh, the Partnership for Cooperative Cataloging will require a transliteration as well in a linked field. So if you're cataloging for Bibco, you'll have to keep that in mind. Of course, publication, manufacturer, or distribution information will go in your 264 field. It is important to note for early printed materials, a distribution or a manufacturer statement can be treated as a publication statement. As is the case for this book, Life of King Charles the Martyr, printed for Richard Chiswell at the Rosen Crown in St. Paul's Churchyard, 1687. That could be treated as a publication statement rather than just a manufacturer statement. Now, RDA 2.8.1.1 does not define what dates are early. And I will say here, according to my judgment, an early printed resource in England would have a quite different date from an early printed resource in Africa. And from personal experience, I've seen a lot of African books because I lived there for eight years. I know that as recently as the 1980s, and I think into the 1990s, some printers in Africa were using similar statements as printers were in London in the 1680s. So I think that we need to use judgment and do research as needed to determine whether or not we're going to apply this rule. Place and name of publisher, distributor, or manufacturer should be transcribed exactly as it appears on the resource. This is contrary to many records that are available in OCLC, and I will put myself out here and admit that I created some of those records before I knew better. These records will use the standard English name for the place of publication, even though that is not what is on the item. Here is an example of this. This is the Polish edition of John Grisham's The Rogue Warrior. It includes both distribution and publication information. The city of publication is Warsaw, but RDA's, RDA directs use of the Polish spelling rather than the English spelling. You can see the difference in spelling there. Now, at first glance, this does not make sense. The main reason why it doesn't make sense to me is that Patrons especially are not going to know what that is when they see that city. But we have to keep in mind RDA is designed as a universal standard. It is not simply an American standard or even an Anglo-American standard. If we were supposed to use the common American name, then our records would not be usable in a country where a different common name is used. By transcribing exactly what appears on the item, this allows more people to use the same record. Also, I will note that by transcribing, this avoids potentially thorny political problems, such as the recent question of how do you spell Kiev? By transcribing what is on the item, we are protected at least somewhat from accusations of bias by recording what some would consider the wrong spelling. I have a few more notes on the 264 field. RDA prefers using a cataloger supplied place of publication to no place of publication. Of course, that holds true for English and non-English materials. The use of place of publication not identified, which I see on very many records, should only be a last resort when there is no possible way to determine where an item might have been published. One can assume that a book in Bulgarian was probably published in Bulgaria, unless there is some evidence to the contrary. Now, of course, you cannot be sure of that. So there should be a question mark in addition to the brackets signifying that it is catalog or supplied. Furthermore, even when supplying the place, the name that is used for that place at the time of publication should be used rather than the current name. This can get rather confusing. A book that was published in what is now Croatia in the 1980s should be Yugoslavia. A book published in what is now Zimbabwe in 1975 should be Rhodesia, and so forth. I also want to note that many European printers will have a very prominent printer's note 
and publication information, particularly the place of publication, may not be on the item or may not be prominently on the item. Also in Europe, thanks to the European Union, country of printing is often not the country of publication. Many, if not most, Scandinavian books are printed by Scandbook, which is in Lithuania. So a book published in Sweden is frequently printed in Lithuania. So you have to be careful that you're putting things in the right place. Also for the date of publication, RDA prefers recording numerals in the form used by the cataloging agency, which would be our standard English numbers. However, if you're cataloging for Bibco, the PCC policy says that you should follow the source of information, which for older books in English is often Roman numerals, but for books in languages other than English might be a variety of numeral symbols. I've noticed, I'll note that India has several different ways of writing numbers. I'll also note that I don't see very many records that follow that, but that's what the policy statement says anyway. In the 300 field, numerals follow the format preferred by the cataloging agency, whether you're doing Bibco or not. So the uh, Hindi numerals would be used for the date in the 264, but not the pages in the 300. Additionally, I want to note that if you have a work in multiple volumes that uses Roman numerals, uh, you are not going to use those Roman numerals when you're recording your number of volumes in your 300 field. Spanish, of course, tends to use Roman numerals for multiple volumes. So a Spanish work in multiple volumes might have tomos one through four, but your 300 field is still going to say four volumes in the standard English way of writing things. Finally, here are some other fields that appear rather frequently, but not on every record. First, your edition statement, which would be, of course, in your 250 field. Per RDA, this should be transcribed exactly as it appears on the resource. Of course, you have the option to supply a translation if it is believed to be necessary. And I will also note, uh, for anything that has to be in the original language or the script, you can supply a translation uh, at the very least in a general note field, if not anywhere else. Um, RDA 2.5.1.4 provides the option to supply an addition statement if none is present on the item. I encourage supplying one if there may be a small difference between two editions because that can help to prevent erroneous deduplication. Unfortunately, in many cases, you're not going to have multiple editions of the same book to compare them. So this is a case where you just have to use your best judgment. And then of course, for, for series statements in your 490 or 8XX fields, the series statement should be transcribed exactly as it appears on the resource. Uh, if the title proper of the series has been established and the established form differs slightly, then you will use your established form in your 800 or 830. I'll also note that if the title of the series appears in multiple languages or scripts, which can happen very frequently with some non-English resources, you should use the same language and script as the majority of the resource. This has been a lot of information to take in, and there are a lot of little complexities to providing a full, full cataloging of non-English resources that are not present in a typical English language resource. In some cases, even as RDA attempts to be more inclusive, it actually places further barriers in front of an Anglo-American cataloger cataloging these non-English resources. I think it is important to remember that we are cataloging these items not to create immaculate records that can be used as perfect examples in cataloging classes. We're cataloging them to serve our patrons. I would love for every record I create to be perfect, but we should not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It is fine and possibly recommended to input a level K record when needed, if that's what it takes to get the item out there. I'll now hand it over to Joy to discuss particularly difficult problems and how to overcome them. Now that we know the rules and the correct information we need, it's time to look at how we get it. Once upon a time, cataloging departments would have multilingual catalogers process non-English pieces. Many still do. 
However, with tightening budgets and fewer catalogers, more and more departments are looking for other methods. That's where these tools can help. Even if multilingual catalogers are available, they may run across a language they are not familiar with. Now, unfortunately for many people who do not like to spend a lot of time on one book, non-English materials do require a bit of research to get them done. Sometimes it's as easy as typing something into Google, and sometimes it takes a great deal of searching, especially with older or more ancient materials. Now, if a complicated book hits my desk and I'm having difficulty finding anything in OCLC due to the language, my first step would be to use an online translator. Now, some may be wondering why use a translator if all you need to do is find a record. One benefit that a translator can provide is helping you to identify the language. By using a translator with a keyboard function or just a multi-language keyboard site, it is possible to compare and contrast the letter characteristics until you find the language that connects to the material. This can be a long process, but can help people identify an unfamiliar language. After using the translator to identify languages, Users can then input the non-Roman alphabet characters and copy and paste the information into OCLC. By translating title pages and title verso pages, it is possible to recover information relating to the publisher, date, and official translator of the piece. Okay. There are two translators and one multi-language keyboard slash dictionary site that I use with some frequency, and these are absolutely free. I found these by literally typing into Google free Russian translator and Russian language keyboard after an extremely frustrating day. So they were quite easy to find. STARS 21 is the main translator site that I use. However, it is by no means perfect. It has ads, requires pop-ups, and can be fairly confusing, but it can also be worth it. You can pick the language you are translating from in the aptly named From box. STARS has language options from Afrikaans to Zulu, so it is likely you will find the language that you wish to translate. Once you have chosen the original language that you are translating from, the keyboard icon will open a second window. You may have to enable pop-ups allowing you to insert characters by clicking on them individually with the mouse. Once finished, click Send at the bottom of the keyboard screen and it will automatically place it into a box to be translated. And then click the button that says Translate. Once that is done, it will go to another screen where you can see the translations. Now on the left side, it will list all the translators available you can see which ones are checked, meaning used. The red arrow shows which translator is currently in use, and you can switch between the translations of the checked ones. Again, it can be a confusing process, but it has its rewards. Another translate, the second translator that I use, which many of you may be familiar with, is Google Translate. Google Translate is a good free translator, and like STARS 21, has a wide range of languages. There are two ways to use Google Translate, from the Google Translate Lite site itself and from searching Google Translate from the Google search bar. From the Google Translate page, it is possible to use a foreign keyboard function to draw the characters using the mouse and to use the detect languages function. Picking the language you wish to translate from is easy and only requires that you click the tiny arrow next to detect language. Also, to use the keyboard function or to draw characters, use the tiny scroll menu from the bottom of the text bar. However, if using the search bar method, the keyboard and drawing functions are not available, so you can still detect languages. Google Translate is an excellent translator, though like STARS too, it can have its hangups. Another tool available to catalogers is a multilingual keyboard like Lexigo Logos. LexiLogos is a multilingual keyboard that allows users to input languages into a text box. The user just selects the language from the index page. There are no pop-ups and you only go to a new screen once you pick your language from the index. What the keyboard allows you to do is to input the letters of the keyboard 
once again using the mouse, into the text box at the top of the screen. And here you can see the page for Russian. You can then copy and paste the new sentence into online translators or paste it directly into OCLC to search for a record. While the fact that it's not a translator is not ideal, it is a useful tool to have while cataloging non-English materials. Besides the keyboard function, Lexilogo site can act as an online dictionary hub, connecting users to various dictionaries in which to search words. The site, the dictionary site, allows users to choose a language dictionary and then the dictionary itself from which to search. Different languages can have many different dictionaries from which to choose. For example, there are three online dictionary sites for the Czech language, while Arabic has eight. Some other resources I have heard about are a foreign language keyboard app that you can download from Google and type in the characteristics of the language. I have personally been unable to try it since it would not load properly on my computer. Also, there is an app that allows you to take pictures of materials on your phone and it will identify the language. However, it has shown to be unreliable many times and I doubt that it would work well with block German or hidden written materials. Translators in general make it easier to understand non-English materials and the multilingual keyboard makes it easier to find the materials in the database. However, neither of these are a perfect solution. Because these materials are free, they may go down or have languages unavailable at unexpected times. Also, there are many different ways to translate certain words. If you need example of this, look at our word, hello. We may say, hi, hello, hey, and they would all translate to someone else as hello. No translator is perfect, but these reasons are why it's important to have a multitude of translators when you want to check a sentence or in case one goes down. Now, so far, we have been discussing translators and database searches as they relate to fairly modern materials. However, the older the material in question, the harder it is to catalog. There are several reasons why this is the case. Just as the English language has changed over the centuries, so have the languages of other countries. You need to only look at Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, or the works of William Shakespeare to see how the English, English language has changed. Because the language has evolved and changed through time, modern translators online may have a harder time correctly translating the materials into English. Lastly, you will discover when trying to find records for older and ancient materials that many times there are records that may look pretty much the same, except for a word or two. So with these problems, what is the best way to handle older materials? For the older books, research really comes into play, simply because many times translators won't help a great deal. I rarely use the translators unless it is in Latin or Greek. Latin being a dead language has not changed much over the years and has stayed pretty much the same. Also, Greek and Latin were part of a gentleman's education and were regularly taught and written until the beginning part of the 20th century. For the databases, I make sure to search the entire title, or at least a really good part of it. Going back through some of the older records, we have found that many mistakes were made because the original catalogers only searched for part of the title and the chosen record and the piece in hand did not actually match. It is also good to pay special attention to the publisher and date information. One example was the case of the Acta Sanctorum books. This was a long range of books that had all been put on one record based solely on the title. However, upon closer inspection, it was discovered that they all had different places of publication. Upon further research online through several religious websites, it was discovered that we did not have one run of Acta Sanctorum. We had three, three different editions that had been put on one record. So it is very important to search accurately and to double check the records. For materials not in Latin or Greek, I would encourage the use of the Lexilogos keyboard more than the translators. This again would allow you to search 
and OCLC for the record or for information without worrying about a spotty translation. If you need to create or enhance a record, keep in mind that not all the words may translate correctly. With these materials, I end up searching the internet a great deal for, the, for authors, publishers, and places of publication. If you can deduct the author, you can Google his name and may be able to find out relative information about him, like if he wrote primarily about poetry or mathematics or dogs. For older books, many will not actually list a publisher, but a printer. By searching this information, it is possible to see where they are based from. Um, also, as to the publication place, you, might search, you may find by searching in what country the place exists. Once while looking up a publication place, I looked up Wien, Germany, which was listed as a publication place for ma several materials published during the 1940s. We would know this city today as Vienna, Austria, but during the time, it was Germany. Research is the key to these materials. By doing a little searching, you can find some interesting facts, not only to help find and enhance the records, but for enjoyment as well. Now that we have discussed using databases and translators on modern and older non-English materials, it is important to discuss some unique problems that may come about while working on these languages. One major problem is the Chinese language. The Chinese language is one of the most difficult languages to learn and consists of thousands of characters. Google Translate and STARS can both translate Chinese to an extent, but the difficulty is that other languages have Chinese characteristics. Some of these are Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese. This can make the original language of the materials much more difficult to identify and much harder to translate. For example, this book in Japanese. This book had been put on our No Hope shelf because the original cataloger could not identify the language. I had a very hard time as well. I was 50% sure it was Japanese, but my Japanese translator would not translate it. So I started scanning the book and noticed it had a name I could search, Ishikawa Shigatoshi. By doing a basic OCLC keyword search on this name, I found several records that had the same characters from the book I could not translate. However, no records for the book I was specifically looking for. The records I did find all had the language code of Japanese, so I had that going for me. It turns out this book was written in a different form of Japanese that my translator did not understand. By doing a research using a great deal of image searching and Googling, I was able to get a good idea what the book was. Finally, by using the Lexa logo site, I inputted the Japanese characters from the cover and then copy and pasted them into a Google search bar. The book was discovered to be a copy of Prometheus Unbound by Percy Shelley and Ishikawa Shikitoshi to be the translator. The next example of problematic material is this Bible. I know, it's a Bible, right? How hard can it be? Famous last words. The volume was very close to Latvian. But once again, it could not translate and I could not find a record. So I started asking my colleagues for help after being properly stumped. Our manuscript archivist took a picture and sent it to her friend who read Latvian, and he said, no, it's not Latvian. So I did some digging. I was able to find some information on A books for a piece very similar to this. Turns out it is Latvian. Until the 19th century, the Latvian written language was heavily influenced by German. And because the book was published in the early parts of the 19th century, it still contained that influence. So the Bible is actually written in a special mixture of Latvian and German that was created during those times for the German missionaries. The last example is this magazine. The lettering on this magazine is written in the traditional block German or fracture and can be fairly difficult to understand. Fracture was a Gothic script that was used before the 1940s. There have been many materials in this style, and I have found the best way to handle these is to translate them into modern German. One way to do this is to use this Germanic alphabet chart. This chart compares modern German to three different writing styles, an example of handwriting styles. This makes it much easier to search online for information or to put it through the language translators. 
This particular magazine was a theological magazine which was published in Germany from the 1800s to the 1950s called Wilhelm and Klaus Dingsmann Chiefs, and I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. So as we mentioned earlier, cataloging and processing non-English materials is hard. It's hard and it takes time. And you may be wondering, when is a good time to stop and ask for help? Well, only you can really answer that. After all, every person is different, just like every case. However, some signs that you may need help is that you have tried multiple translators and are completely lost on the language or that you have searched and searched and can find no information on the piece. In other words, you're stuck. However, help is never too far away. MSU has a foreign language department and many of the professors there are more than happy to help with a language problem. If you work for an academic library, try reaching out to your language departments and asking them if they would mind helping. That being said, I really try hard not to bother them too much. Another person to ask if you're working with Latin and our stuff is priest. The clergy and those who attend seminary still learn Latin and Greek and may be able to provide some insight. Also, do not overlook the resource of your fellow catalogers and coworkers. They may be able to read other languages or like my manuscript archivist colleague, have friends that do. Also, check with your student workers. Currently, we have one student he can, who can read German and even a bit of block German. The listservs are another good way to ask for help. Post your language question and someone will generally be able to assist you. There are many options available to help with non-English language materials and help is never too far away. So in conclusion, non-English language materials are hard and require a great deal of work, research, and occasionally help to find or create records. However, they can also give a great deal back. They enhance our collection, collections and they also enhance us as catalogers and researchers by exposing us to new languages and information that before we would never have known about. So the next time we have a difficult book appear on our desks, we can take it in stride because once you've cataloged a book in Icelandic, English materials look absolutely tame. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joy, and to Preston. This has been a really interesting and helpful presentation. And we do now have about 10 minutes or so for questions. If you are an attendee and have not entered your question into the question box, please do so now so that we can have time to get to it. Um, the first one that came in is we have a question about the 041 field. Preston, do you mind talking a little bit about that field? Certainly, I can talk about the 041 field. Uh, that would be handled the exact same way as you would uh, if you had any sort of multilingual book. You're going to have your uh, the language the book is in, of course, is going to be in subfield A. If it's a translation, then the original language would be in subfield H. There are also a few other uh, rules governing that. I do not know them all off of the top of my head, but uh, for example, if you're doing subtitles of a movie, uh, there's a code for that. There are different subfield codes for different parts, but the ones that I encounter the most are, of course, the language the material is in, in subfield A, which of course will match the uh, language code from the fixed fields, and then the language of the original in subfield H. I hope that right, answers thank the you. question. Um, we have another question here. This attendee has a book that is predominantly in Spanish with English and French translations. So since the information is in Spanish, do they then transcribe it as is? For example, would they put Primera Edition in the 250 field? And I probably botched that pronunciation, I'm sorry. Well, that's certainly close enough on the pronunciation, and and the answer is yes. You would transcribe that as it appears on the on the title page. Uh, you can provide a, a translation of that uh, either in brackets or uh, you know with an equal sign, uh, depending on where you 
where you are in the record. Uh, I generally like to do my addition statement with the transcribed and then uh, equals whatever the English equivalent would be. Uh, but yes, your, your goal is to transcribe exactly from the resource. All right, thank you. Um, now for hybrid languages like the Latvian German example that Joy gave, which language code would you use? And if you need to propose a new language code, how do you do that? What I did is I put it down as Latvian because at that time period, it was pretty much Latvian. It was, this material was made specifically for the missionaries that came in. And for what I researched is each volume was a little bit different for each specific missionary. And, and I will add on this, and, and uh, this has to do also with the 546 field. When you have a situation like that, where you have a language that is written in a script that may not be the main script for that language, or a language that is written in multiple scripts, you definitely would want to put a note in the 546 field. So your language code is, would be Latvian, but in the 546 field, then you could, you could uh, fill that out a little bit more to explain to somebody what it is, and definitely to put what script is used. All right, thank you. Um, our next question is, how do you uh, use the LexiLogos keyboard for CJK material? Is it possible? Chinese Japanese group. Um, okay, for like uh, the Japanese book that I did, um, I was able to look at the LexiLogos and actually just put it into a text box. That's all it is, is just putting these characters into a text box. And so then you can do whatever you want to with it. And partially to that, the dictionaries also help because you can look up exact words. And frankly, the Japanese material was a year ago, and I think the LexiLogos keyboard has changed since then. They are always updating and changing and trying to make things better. But it, what, it did allow me to put in the materials into a text box and then put it into Google and Google did its magic to do the searching. If that answered the All question. Right. I did. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, do you know of any sites that provide Arabic or Persian transliteration macros? I have not looked directly for Arabic or Persian. Now I will note that Google is attempting to develop something and, and the name of it escapes me right now that would enable this to happen. However, I'll also note they're probably not going to be using the ALA LC transliteration tables to develop that because those generally are not used by online transliteration sites. Uh, some online transliteration sites do provide that as an option, though. Uh, but I have not directly looked into Arabic or Persian. Uh, those are not materials that I've dealt with very much. Have you dealt with any of that? Um, the translate site that I use, this is not, it doesn't match up correctly with the LC translate tables. Um, I believe it's translate.cc. I believe they have something in Arabic, but again, it does not match up 100% with the transliteration tables that Library of Congress provides. And I'll note to that that even if it doesn't match up 100%, it doesn't mean that you can't use it as a tool. You can use it as a starting point and then go through the table and see what matched up and what didn't and make corrections and that a lot of times will be easier than just starting from scratch. And I believe that site is translit.cc. If you Google that, you may be able to find it. All right, thank you. Um, so our next question is that this attendee sometimes has issues with accent marks transferring or exporting properly from connection to Sierra. Um, sometimes they go missing after the move from the record into Sierra. Do you have any advice for resolving that? I wish that I had advice for resolving that. Uh, I do not have much experience working with Sierra, unfortunately. Uh, I, I would say 
on, I wish that there was an, an answer that I could give. Uh, but I will also say that once the record is in your system, if you need to do something uh, within your system that is not quite kosher as far as the rules are concerned to, uh, to make that visible and to communicate to your patrons, you know, who the author is, what the item is, uh, then it's completely your prerogative to do that. Uh, so as long as the record is right before exporting, then that's fine for everybody else, but you still have the problem for, for your situation. And unfortunately, I do not have an answer to that. Um, I have worked at, on Web Voyage, and occasionally we did have that problem. And again, I would use something like Lexa Logos to put it in and have the accent marks. And then once I imported it, I would just, I would have the little tofu boxes or some weird boxes and I would pretty much copy and paste them over just to get them in there. And I don't know if they say, stayed in there, but from the ones I have looked at, they have. So it just takes a little finagling to try to outwit the system just a little bit. Yeah, I'm not sure how Sierra codes their special characters. And uh, so that, that could, it could be as simple as, uh, a switch between Unicode and, and another form, uh, or it could be something more complex. I don't know for sure. Right, great, thank you. Um, and then we just had a couple of comments come in in response to some of the past questions. Um, specifically, someone just wanted to mention that OCLC Connection does have an Arabic Persian transliterator, and that there's other macros available for use in OCLC to transliterate other scripts, such as Cyrillic and Armenian and others. Um, so thank you for chiming in on that. Um, the next question is that for high quantity transliteration needs, do you, have you or ever heard of successful collaborations with language departments in academic institutions to develop projects where the advanced students do transliterations for the library? I have not, though I have um read an article a while back and um, they had to translate a bunch of Japanese materials and add in the English language and then bring them into their system and they used mark edit to do a big batch load at a time I don't know how the foreign language department would do it depends on your own personal foreign language department some of them specialize in other languages you know each one could be a little bit different and I imagine it would depend on your academic library situation. Some of them may really go for it and some of them may not. You also have the, the issue uh, with a, a native speaker doing transliteration. Uh, that there, there's two issues that can happen. One is they're very familiar with their own language and how to pronounce it. So possible problems uh, that would come up for a non-native speaker, they will not uh, think of necessarily. Uh, but a student should not have that problem if we're talking about uh, foreign language students. Uh, the other issue being that there are so many different means of transliteration and uh, the ones being taught in foreign language departments are often not going to be the same uh, if they even like to use a standard at all. A lot of people uh, will just like to transliterate based on how they pronounce it. Uh, which can be problematic depending on, uh, for example, whether you're British or American, you pronounce the same set of letters in very different ways. And so one set of transliterations might not work in uh, British English while it works fine in American English. So you run into some things like that. Okay, thank you. So we do only have time for one more question, and I just want to reiterate that our presenters have agreed to answer any unanswered questions in writing, so you will be sent those answers along with the recording within the next couple of days. So if we didn't get to your question, don't worry, you will receive an answer. Um, the last question we're gonna cover though is that, do you use the 242 in your library? Is it okay to use this field? I have used that field. Um, I've used it on materials from both the Herring and the Starling. Um, I, I really enjoy using that field. It, to me, it just makes it easier. I also use that field. I tried to stick mostly to core fields, and that, that is, of course, not a core field uh, 
for cataloging. Uh, but I do believe that that's something that needs to be left up to judgment. Uh, I've been part of libraries that did not like to use that field. Uh, I, on the other hand, do like to use it for particularly for materials that are originally in uh, Spanish. We have one collection that has a lot of uh, Cuban and South American literature in it. And much of that has never been translated into English. So I try to use the 242 field to provide an English title for that. All right. So thank you both uh, for your time today and for answering all our questions and your wonderful presentation. This has been a fantastic presentation. And thank you to all of our attendees who were able to be with us today. Um, for, just so everyone is aware, you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to those questions. Your comments are very valuable and do help our Continuing Education Committee plan future events. Uh, your email will also include links to today's slides and recording. We did have a question come in about transcripts. Unfortunately, we do not provide the transcripts. However, the recordings are available on YouTube six months from today, and you can download the transcripts from YouTube when that becomes available. Um, you also have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance, and that information will also be in the email. And so thanks once again to our presenters, Joy DeBose and Preston Salisbury. Thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Felicity Dykus and Wanda Jazzieri, and to Alana Warren from the ELECT office. The support they provide make, us po make it possible for us to present these webinars. Alex does have other continuing education events coming up. We have a full fall webinar season. Uh, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, September 18th on using LCSH pattern headings. Please see the ELECT website to register or to find more information on these. And finally, ELECT also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-forum will be on September 10th discussing mentoring and technical services. Check the website for more information on upcoming courses and discussions. Once again, thank you all for joining us today, and this will conclude our session.